Hey guys, welcome back to Radio Rothbard, joined as always by Ryan McMakin. And Ryan, a topic we discussed for this episode, obviously uh, we're still dealing with uh, some of the interesting fallout from one of the biggest changes to uh, cable news in quite some time, the canning of Tucker Carlson, though I guess it's not really a canning, he's still being paid by Fox, that's not a bad gig right there, but the silencing, I suppose, of Tucker Carlson might be the, the more appropriate word, and we're now seeing a very interesting, uh, the, the leaking of various off-screen or off-show clips, um, which is probably an inside job, kind of safe to assume there, maybe a PR campaign from the, uh, the Rupert Murdoch Enterprise and uh, all rumors and innuendo about different things, but more relevant for this show is that it does bring to mind some of the history of, let's say, right-wing purges in alleged conservative media. And of course, one such purge is our namesake, Murray Rothbard, who had some very strong feelings about uh, Bill Buckley in the National Review after his treatment from the very serious conservative outlet back in the day. And so I think that's kind of gonna be our, our Mises Institute hook on this. There's also a great article by Michael, Michael Rechtenwald published last week. Obviously, Dr. Rechtenwald had done some stuff with Tucker, Tucker appearing as a guest and also on one of his specials. Uh, but Ryan, as someone who has been a observer of the uh, controlled oppositional aspects of the conservative movement, if you will, for, for quite some time, someone who, who always has a bone to pick with uh, uh, some of the appoint, self-appointed gatekeepers of the right that loves to attack and smear anyone that uh, kind of gets too far out of line of the regime. What are your thoughts on Tucker Carlson, obviously someone whose economic views at times always love where, you know, he would take the occasional pot shot at Austrians which I, I think was always in his mind some sort of shot of the Koch brothers, which, you know, not, not my favorite thing that Tucker ever did, but obviously a great voice on uh, anti-war issues. Uh, I definitely, I know from dealing with uh, uh, kind of, let's call them normie, though increasingly normie conservatives is becoming a radicalized conservative in today's day and age. Um, I know he, he was definitely a voice that helped grow some of the uh, skepticism, some of the disillusionment, if you will, with various long-held uh, icons, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, whether it's woke generals, whether it is the FBI, various aspects of the American regime that conservatives long held as near and dear heroes of the Constitution. I think Tucker helped play a role in shaping opinions in closer to our direction. And so Tucker, just uh, Ryan, just off the start, uh, what are your original thoughts with the uh, the silencing of Tucker Carlson? Well, it's, it strikes me as a sort of purge, right? I mean, if we're look, if we're assuming that that Fox News is essentially an organ of the conservative movement, which I think it is. Uh, now, of course, their primary concern is to make money. It's a big corporate enterprise, um, but I think they're also an attempt there to position themselves as an important part of the Republican Party and the conservative movement. And you can see that, of course, that was so blatantly obvious back during in the Iraq war days, always overwhelmingly supportive of George W. Bush and the war effort and all of that. And uh, this was, of course, a, a station that spent a lot of time denouncing, canceling, and generally silencing anyone. Uh, and censoring anyone who opposed the war, who did um, the political correctness of that time was to support the war. And they, of course, took the PC position and banished into the outer darkness anyone who violated that. And it's interesting that you can be just, just truly awful and still have a job at Fox News, unless, of course, you oppose whatever the latest fashionable war is uh, and whatever aspect of the, uh, the security state is currently uh, what needs to be defended and supported. So uh, you can be Bill O'Reilly. It took forever for all... <laughs> <laughs> for just what a despicable human being he is to catch up with him uh, in terms of all of those lawsuits. 
And uh, why does Sean Hannity still have a job at Fox News while Tucker Carlson does not? Well, Hannity's always been a reliable supporter of the regime. And so it's it's not a coincidence, I think, that once Carlson starts voicing significant opposition uh, to the Ukraine war, to the security state in general, starts badmouthing the CIA and the FBI, uh, that that's then suddenly he doesn't have a show anymore. Now, obviously, all these guys were always terrible on economics, right? The, the, the whole movement tends to be bad on economics. Uh, they, they're protectionists. Uh, you, Bannon thinks, uh, Steve Bannon thinks it's some genius move to just buy voters with a large welfare state. Um, it's just kind of the right-wing version of FDR. Uh, you got, uh, of course, people whining about free trade at the American conservative. And of course, on Tucker's show, he, he trots up people on there talking about you need like federal welfare programs, uh, like uh, paid family leave mandated at the federal level, all that sort of thing. But I guarantee you, nobody ever had a problem with that at Fox News or any other uh, conservative outlet, because what they really care about is what is your position on supporting the regime? And right now you need to hate Russia. Uh, you need to just never question what is uh, this national security state up to. And that's that's what got Tucker in trouble. I mean, yeah, now they're trotting out. Oh, look at this alarming email he sent. Yeah, like there's not emails like that for all their other quote unquote talent. Uh, we, <laughs> I mean, if Sean Hannity hasn't sent his share of despicable emails in his time at Fox News, I will be shocked, shocked. Uh, but uh, so it just happens to be now Tucker Carlson who's facing uh, all of those sorts of tactics. And so I'm not surprised uh, at all that now he's being targeted because he's expressed um, un-PC views as far as supporting the regime goes. Well, and the Hannity point is worth emphasizing here, I think, because you know, there's all these different narratives about why this happened out there. And, you know, part of this, obviously, it was coming right off of the settlement that Fox News had with Dominion voting machines and that whole aspect of kind of the, the you know, civil law dynamic. And that, that cost Fox News, I believe, you know, north of $700 million, which is a you know, hefty bit of change there. And yet Tucker was actually, I remember back in the day, um, you know, with, with some very strong Trump supporters of, you know, that, that I know were very upset with Tucker because he kind of ignored the, you know, Mike Lindell voter, you know, changing of, of, of tallies and that dynamic, that, that narrative that spun out of the 2020 election. And yet Sean Hannity was more aggressive in promoting it. Um, Within that lawsuit, there were various text messages that came out of some of the Fox News personalities were, were bad-mouthing Sidney Powell, who kind of became the face of, you know, she's going to unleash the Kraken of, on the Divinian voting machine issue. And yet Tucker, you know, always kind of saw her as a kook, um, did not, you know, kind of play along with that for clicks. And yet he was the one that got the ax. There was a narrative out there about concerns about future lawsuits. Um, some of them more of the petty, oh, where there was a producer that didn't like her treatment that may have never actually met Tucker Carlson in person. Um, but that kind of goes to there, there seems to be you know, a few of those lawsuits, you know, every year at Fox and many other media outlets. It's kind of just the, the cost of doing business in certain ways. Um, but then the other one was, oh, well, you know, Ray Epps, the, the, the alleged, uh, the, the, the poor victim, if you talk to uh, Adam Kersinger and, and the, the January 6th committee, the, the, the people that were the person that was unfairly demonized by online MAGA types and Tucker Carlson included um, for suggesting that he was a Fed op instigator um, when, you know, there's video evidence of him saying we've got to go into the Capitol the night before and people, you know, saying Fed, 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 um, a lot of very curious behavior around that man. Like, oh, well, he opens up future lawsuits like the Dominion lawsuit. Um, you know, regarding January 6th issues, regarding some of this sort of stuff. Also, not quite sure if that really is the main play. And then there was a Vanity Fair piece that was very juicy um, in many ways that it was um, largely Tucker Carlson's more uh, overt religious commentary. He just gave a talk at the Heritage Foundation the week in prior to his unscheduled canning. Um, 
uh, where, where he said that you know, increasingly he sees prayer as the solution and that there was even a interaction that he had with Rupert Murdoch's fiance uh, that took a religious tone that apparently freaked out Rupert Murdoch, who I'm not surprised, not the, most, not the biggest true believer out there. Um, and that they, that they broke up shortly thereafter and that that played a role perhaps in Rupert Murdoch's decision that did come from up top. Um, and yet we also see the fallout from it, which when you have Pentagon officials openly cheering the firing of Tucker Carlson because, oh, well, you know, he was just bad mouthing, you know, the military and this like this, that and the other. No, he was, he was bad mouthing military leadership that has been a disaster uh, repeatedly for, for 20 plus years at the destruction of, of you know, American lives, American capital, American treasure, um, you know, American prestige, American, you know, in, any sort of, of uh, uh, you know, alleged moral superiority um, that the world, you know, might have saw after, you know, the Cold War, the good old days of the Cold War, completely out the window and that, you know, that's, that, that can lead to a conversation about the, the <laughs> global distancing from the dollar, um, which is a, a tangent upon itself. But that, you know, that message, obviously, there are very powerful forces, whether it is the financial interest within uh, Fox News. Um, I know there's those connections with, with BlackRock and things like that. Michael Rechtenwald touched on some of those incentives within his Mises Wire piece. Um, but, you know, while we might not be entirely certain why Tucker was canned, we, do, we can be certain about who is happy about it, and it is these these bad guys um it is the regime and one of the things i think is going to be very interesting and we're already kind of seeing it uh you know the the only company that compares right now with fox news in terms of distancing uh lifelong customers or, or chronic customers um is bud light and their pr disaster the the degree to which the audience which obviously tucker inherited a very large platform. You know, Bill O'Reilly was the titan of cable news before he took that slot. We've seen other commentators be successful. We've also seen Fox survive those replacements. You know, the, the audience did not leave with Bill O'Reilly. The audience did not leave when um, uh, 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 Megyn uh, Kelly left, who was another big name. Um, the Fox brand was larger than the talent. And yet here, when we see such an audience decline, um, it's not helped when, you know, he's quickly replaced with Brian Kilmeade that's up there going, you know, the, the real problem now is, you know, you, it was, was our repeal from Afghanistan, which is creating all sorts of issues, right? I mean, the, the, them running, you know, content like that immediately after was just a little too on point. Um, but the audience not coming back to Fox, not coming back to that time slot, I think really speaks to the, the larger moment that we've been chronicling on this show which is the degree to which a lot of, again, traditional, you know, voted for Bush twice, uh, voted for, for, for McCain and Romney, you know, people that were very loyal to the generic Republican brand, even if they might complain a little bit and, and go to a Tea Party rally, um, you know, they were still loyal to conservative institutions. And yet Tucker was the one person who I think really spoke to the breakdown of respect, breakdown of credibility that these forces have. And conservatives not just kind of going along and, and you know, complaining about it a little bit, but then returning to their usual nighttime viewing. I think that is a, a very optimistic sign here that there is more genuine, genuine interest in those you know, outlets, and I, Mises Institute being one of them, um, that is willing to call out who is, you know, ripping off average Americans. And that is something where I, I think this is a big difference than some of the past examples of, you know, whether it was, you know, Murray Rothbard being purged from the National Review, whether it was, you know, the destruction of the John Birch Society, um, which, again, you know, not that they didn't have their own quirks in their own right, um, you know, the treatment that Pat Buchanan received, right, you know, being blasted as a, as a dreaded anti-Semite, um, you know, within the pages of respectable conservative media, um, you know, the, they didn't really suffer a consequence from purging genuine, uh, you know, th that, that genuine sort of, of you know, right-wing rebellion. Here, I think Fox News really is, and I think that's a, a reflection of something much larger going on than simply, you know, a, a cable news lineup. 
Yeah, I, th I think they're going to just try, and you can see it already in who they replaced uh, Tucker with. They're, they're going back to the regular old theme of uh, pro-war, pro-interventionist, pro-regime stuff with a little bit of free market economics on the side. And that's what the conservative movement has been about uh, since the 1950s and talking about the old purge of, of Murray from National Review. So it's, it's important, the, important to keep in mind that that's been the MO for decades is that Buckley became the gatekeeper of the movement and what was important to the movement was militant anti-communism and everything else was just something on the side to try and keep together some sort of political coalition. And so that's why you get the purges of those people. The John Birch Society was purged not because of any domestic issue or social issue, but because they opposed the Vietnam War. Uh, Rothbard was purged because he opposed uh, US militarism and the way that Buckley wanted the policy of containment. He, uh, he also purged his own brother-in-law, Brent Bozell Jr., not the guy who's now on TV sometimes, that's the third, but his father who uh, had come out against the Vietnam War as well and took a much more religious and traditionalist approach uh, to American politics. Buckley kicked him out and cast him out into the outer darkness. So the, the motivation has always been to protect support for the, for the regime. And of course, Buckley, who all closely allied with the CIA going way, way back, was a company man. Um, and of course, a trained professional liar. And so he uh, would, would spread lies about anybody in any way that was necessary to then tarnish them. And that's what he did, of course, with Rothbard. When Rothbard died, uh, Buckley published this really snarky, non-eulogy, this obituary about how, yeah, you know, he died, feel bad for his family, but good riddance to him and uh, the whole libertarian movement. He just made up a lie about how Rothbard supposedly loved Khrushchev and repeated some story about Rothbard applauding Khrushchev. It just completely made up stuff that Buckley liked to spin yarns about. And but the real problem was Rothbard's opposition to the Vietnam War. Yet, you know, that was the Republican Party's losing war back in the 60s. Yet another war they managed to lose and screw up and get lots of people killed in that produced nothing, no good outcomes. Then they did it all again in uh, in the la over the last 20 years. And what was important was always just to support the FBI and the regime. Um, and so that's the way that the, the movement is still functioning, except for the minority on the side who are these people who uh, chant America first. The, the bad side of America first is the whole protectionism thing. But I'll even accept that if, if America first produces real skepticism about um, the CIA and the latest wars and thinking that Americans should pay another hundred billion dollars to support one of the most corrupt regimes on earth in Ukraine. And if you're gullible enough to think that Ukraine has something to do with American uh, national interests and the protection of ordinary Americans, uh, that is what you're going to hear from most of the mainstream party, most of the conservative movement. And you can see them already ramping it up, right? The hysteria over China. You can't, the, the old folks who watch uh, Fox News, you sit in a room with them for 10 minutes and they're going on and on about the CCP in China. That's how you know you're dealing with someone who watches too much TV news is they don't refer to the regime in Beijing. They don't return, refer to the Chinese government. It's the CCP. What other country do we refer to the party in power instead of the regime itself? It's really weird. Uh, so it's like code. It's like right-wing hysterical anti-China code. It's the, what the CCP is up to. Uh, just call it Beijing. That's that's what it is. So uh, you can see how that they're grooming people now to uh, start a new Cold War and be hysterical over China um, and Russia too. But Russia so obviously not a real threat. So I think we can see where the conservative movement is going now with that. Uh, and so if the mainstream wins on that, it's just going to be a repeat 
of what we've been seeing since the 1950s. What matters is militaristic opposition to whoever the current foreign boogeyman is. And we'll throw in a little bit where we'll, we'll cut taxes by 1%. Uh, but as long as you keep supporting trillion-dollar deficits to support the uh, the state and uh, the military apparatus, then then you're sufficiently conservative. So obviously Tucker didn't fit into that at all. And you can see, uh, I think, even less famous people being purged uh, in some of these right-wing think tanks uh, elsewhere uh, as well. So I think the m the more time goes on, there's going to be more and more of a desperate need uh, to really... Uh, focus on the anti-Russia, anti-China thing. So we should expect more of this. And I think what's going to happen at Fox News is they're going to try and really go back in that direction, uh, something like 2003, 2004, where, of course, they enjoyed huge ratings. Uh, and they had a clear message, a hysterical foreign policy uh, that they thought was uh, a real easy message. And I think most of the staff there is perfectly happy to go along with it. Certainly Hannity will jump on board real quick, and I think it'll then be up to the oddballs, the people on the fringe, to push back against that. But I think we've certainly lost uh, anyone at Fox News who could really push any sort of reasonable foreign policy. Well, one such purge that happened recently was over at our at the Cato Institute uh, with, with uh, Ted Carpenter, uh, who was a very strong anti-war voice out there, someone who opposed the Iraq War, someone who had been doing a lot of great work opposing American assistance and escalation uh, within the Ukraine-Russia situation, who was canned after a, a very strong pressure campaign um, from a variety of, you know, let's call it regime libertarian um, outsiders, who was, I believe, replaced by Dietra McClowski, which has some jokes there that I'm not going to make. Um, but since we are, I, I do want to, to touch again on, you, know, you mentioned the infamous uh, Buckley obituary for Murray Rothbard, and it is since you know it is worth toasting to Murray. And if you want a one of our new Radio Rothbard coffee mugs, uh, you can I, get. I, I yours. do have my mug. Yes. I just forgot to put my tea in it. So yeah, everyone should have yeah, one. Mises.org <laughs> slash Roth mug. That's R O T H M U G. You can get yours. Um, but the the end of his article, I think, is uh, the, the obituary is is uh, is useful here. Um, I'm going to quote from Bill Buckley. Please excuse me. Um, in Murray's case, much of what drove him was a contrarian spirit, the deranged uh, scru scrupulosity of that caused him to disdain such as Herbert Hoover, Ronald Reagan, Milton Friedman, and yes, Newt Gingrich, while huffing and puffing in the little cloister. Uh, whose walls he labored so strenuously to contract, leaving him in the end not as the father of a swelling movement that roused the masses from their slumber, as he once stated his ambition, but with about as many disciples as David Koresh had in his little redoubt in Waco. Yes, Murray Rothbard believed in freedom, and yes, David Koresh believed in God. Um, that is the end of, of his uh, tribute uh, to, to Rothbard, and I think there, there's a, a few points I want to make on that. One is I think there is a, if, if one is looking for a reason for optimism, is that now when we read these words in 2023, um, you know, far removed from when they were first written in 1995, um, it is true that Murray Rothbard has, in fact, um, been a father of a swelling movement. Um, there are probably far more people today that read Murray Rothbard's work than they read Bill Buckley's work. Um, I think that even within the conservative movement that Buckley built um, or, or, or takes credit for, um, you know, the interest in, let's say, the paleo-libertarian ideas, the respect that someone like a Paul Godfrey has um, who was, you know, a, a friend and a compatriot with Murray. Um, the fact that LouRockwell.com, the articles on there are far more in line with the concerns that I hear from, again, normie conservatives out there. Um, you know, it speaks to the fact that, that your Rothbard's impact, um, you know, you know it, it was far greater um, than, you know, Buckley was able to see. And the, 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 and it's in big part because of you know Buckley's role as being a champion of the establishment as much as you know no, no matter what he you know he, he nominally wanted to say otherwise um, at a time when the underlying 
uh, foundation of that regime is, you know, built on the lies of, you know, fiat currency is built on the lies of, uh, you know, a, a growing oppressive surveillance state that is not simply used to stop the bad guys, but anyone who challenges them. Um, again, the, the questioning of, you know, the, the, the nobility of uh, uh, the, the federal government and the workers thereof, the work of Murray Rothbard is far more useful and understanding our current times um, than anything that Bill Buckley ever wrote. But I think it's also interesting if you contrast uh, Buckley's treatment of Rothbard with that of a, another uh, Buckley foe, uh, Gore Vidal. Um, you know, Vidal, uh, I, in my opinion, one of Buckley's best moments, uh, even though I have a, a great respect for, for Gore Vidal and I highly recommend our readers uh, check out particularly his novels on empire. Uh, his books Burr in 1876 are two of my favorites out there in particular. Um, but uh, Buckley and Fordal actually kicked off this uh, median, really, kind of of the cable news genre. I mean, obviously, it was, it was on ABC at the time. Um, it was them kind of in this, this you know, panel-style discussion covering the 1968 um, presidential uh, conventions uh, of the time. And, um, uh, you know, there, there was this kind of growing antagonism between the two that had already kind of sparred with words. Um, so it, it is kind of fun putting them on the same stage. And you get to the Democrat convention, um, which was held in Chicago at the time. Uh, you know, this is peak, you know, left wing anti-war activism within the Vietnam War. Um, you had, uh, uh, you know, police cl clashes with left wing protesters. Um, I even think um, uh, who who is the the the, the CBS you know uh, uh, loser news news journalist um, uh, the, the guy that had the the Bush Air Force anyway, whatever he he got roughed up at, at one point even during it and and you know there's a to there's a moment there an infamous moment where um, you know Vidal calls Bu uh, Buckley a, a a crypto Nazi. And, you know, Buckley, you know, with his, his you know, accent says, you know, if you, if you call me a, a crypto Nazi one more time, I'm going to sock you in the face uh, and, and you're going to stay plastered. And it was just this, this very emotional for a man whose entire, you know, uh, you know, his entire uh, 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 image, right, was being this, this sophisticated Yale man, right, you know, who was above this rowel. Um, it, it was a real breakdown. It was a real demonstration of his true emotion there. And he spent the rest of his life apologizing for that moment. And so, and, and so, so he spends his entire life trying to, to overcome, um, you know, insulting someone who just personally insulted him. And yet he still can't, you know, restrain himself to very publicly, you know, be, you know, treat someone who just, just passed with the disrespect that he showed Murray, I, I think it really demonstrates who he really saw as the enemy. And because, because Vidal represented, you know, the, the, you know, respectable, if you will, though obviously there were some cultural proclivities with Vidal that I think deeply repulsed um, Buckley, and that's another conversation in itself. Um, you know, Vidal represented the, the intellectual left that Buckley had respect for, he had nothing but disdain for someone like Murray, who attacked him from the right and outed him as a, you know, essentially a traitor to those who looked to him for intellectual guidance wrongly. And I think that dynamic, the difference with which uh, Buckley treated Rothbard versus that in which treated Vidal is still something that's baked into, again, you know, the, the entire, you know, respectability sort of movement, which is, you know, there's, whether it's libertarians that want to coddle up to, um, you know, the New York Times or conservatives that would much rather, um, you know, be respected in cocktail parties in New York, LA and Washington, DC, you know, than ever attend a blue jeans event with a bunch of Trump supporters on the ground. Um, you know, that, that, that genuine conflict there is something that, um, you know, has, 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 has always been at place there. And I think Tucker kind of represents that same dynamic where Tucker, um, while he had good relations, you know, up to a point, you know, with, uh, you know, you know he, he, he was on good terms with the Murdochs until he wasn't. 
Um, he's someone who could navigate those circles and, you know, certainly a guy that came from a very privileged, you know, comes from, you know, this is not a eulogy, but comes from a very privileged background there. He's also someone who has, you know, I, I think was a lot more comfortable with normal people. There was a great clip of, of a guy that was like filming him fly fishing in New York, which I didn't even know you could fly fish in New York. That's a, that's a whole other thing in itself. Um, and that's kind of the funny thing with these clips that are kind of leaking out with Media Matters and the like. What they're really kind of showing is that Tucker is is a likable guy. And okay, yeah, he made some some off color jokes, you know, and, and caught a, a woman yummy, you know, right? And then you know, kind of, kind of it was was great. He was kind of self aware. It's like, oh, if, if this ever gets leaked, you know, screw you, Media Matters, um, within it. But but th there is that dis you know, there is that dynamic that I think has so percolated the the intellectual the uh, the, the intellectual right and you know, calling Fox News part of the intellectual right is, might be giving it too much uh, credit there. Um, <laughs> but but the, the genuine disdain that these conservative outlets have for their audience is something that I, I think is commonplace with uh, uh, Fox News Today, com uh, was true with Buckley's National Review. And I, I think that is an, another very stark cultural difference uh, between figures like Buckley and that of a Murray Rothbard and a uh, Tucker Carlson. Yeah, back to you talking about Buckley's personality. It's interesting that they that his most um, animated, dynamic, and um, passionate language tends to be only on foreign policy because that's what got him really worked up. Here's here's an example of that is. Uh, <laughs> Just like the crazy people today who say, "Oh, we should we shouldn't let the uh, the nuclear arsenal of Russia restrain us from from starting World War III. Uh, the conservative movement back in the '50s and '60s uh, played real free and easy with nuclear war back then too, talking about how you know if we if we have to nuke half the globe, so be it. It'll be worth it. And so Buckley, uh, he, he liked to say stuff like that. He uh, he wanted to sacrifice the, the entire, all of Western civilization in nuclear war. He was saying, if it is right that a single man is prepared to die for a just cause, it is arguably right that an entire civilization be prepared to die for a just cause. Better the chance of being dead than the certainty of being read, and if we die, we die. Well, who's, who's we? Uh, and, and here's a man so insane that he's basically saying, you know, let's sacrifice civilization if necessary. Well, who makes that decision to sacrifice civilization? <laughs> well, it's Buckley's friends, of course, in the regime who he thought uh, eminently possessed this ability to make that decision. Uh, and he and Nash Review employed all sorts of crazy people. Um, I, I mean, he had <laughs> Willie Schlamm. Uh, Clarence Mannion, who routinely said stuff like, oh, you know, I, I would, let's build freedom upon a pile of 20 million corpses and stuff like that. And World War III, nuclear uh, destruction, no big deal. That was all perfectly acceptable in the pages of National Review and in uh, Friendly and other conservative publications. But if you come out and dare suggest that uh, the latest war is a bad idea, well, then no good. You're 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 a, a extremist. You have a deranged view of the world, and so it's just amazing uh, what you can get away with. And and yeah, it, it doesn't look like a whole lot has changed in terms of uh, what really matters and what you can get away with saying. So <laughs> I think we've got a lot of work to do in terms of getting people to really take a more sane view of these sorts of issues. But I think that Trump by accident made a lot of progress there just by really showing how so much of the uh, security state uh, really views itself as uh, the people who really should be in charge and the, and the regular public are just uh, people who shouldn't be allowed to know anything about what's going on and just trust the experts and they'll keep you safe. And uh, they're, just the, the, they're, just, they're just the foreign policy version of Anthony Fauci. They're, uh, the, the level of arrogance is exactly the same and that's what you're getting out of members of the FBI and that sort of thing. So... Um, uh, let's uh, let's keep an eye on these on these organizations. I mean, it obviously would be it would be perfectly fine with me if re if viewership at Fox News just plummeted and disappeared. I certainly don't watch that stuff. Um, I don't know who really is a typical 
cable news watching person. Um, it's I, I don't know. Does, does anyone under 50 watch this stuff? But uh, it still seems to have a lot of people tuning in. And so uh, be gone with it is fine with me. And there's plenty of other outlets where people can get their information. Well, that, that was one of the interesting dynamics of Tucker is that he, his uh, uh, one of his oddly strong performing demos, particularly for Fox News, um, was that he was, I, I believe, watched even more than, you know, progressive outlets out there by, you know, that, that 18 to 45 year old demographic. Like there, there, the Tucker's message um, resonated with with younger viewers. Um, now, some of that might be hate watching. There's always kind of a bit of that built in. Um, uh, but, you know, that that that, you know, that that was one of the things kind of keeping keeping Fox relevant in, in that that degree. Um, and also, you're kind of riffing again on on Buckley's worldview. There was a great uh, talk that uh, the, the aforementioned Paul Godfrey uh, delivered at the, the National Conservatism Conference um, last year. Um, you know, where, where he he noted, you know, kind of the, the worldview of Bill Buckley was a willingness to accept a police state at home. Um, you know, for the necessity of you know military anti-communism abroad, and I think that was the exact opposite of what a, a Tucker Carlson brought to the table, obviously a strong uh, opposite of what Murray Rothbard um, advocated. And I, I think that you, you're breaking away from that, and there's, you know, obviously there's still a lot of challenges. Again, obviously China hysteria being one of them is, is one of the main struggles out there with our, our you know, normie conservative friends. Um, but you know, hopefully, I have a feeling that Tucker's, Tucker's not going anywhere. Um, again, you know, this is very interesting disruption environment, you know, he had a two minute clip, um, which was a great clip about how, you know, the, the, the mainstream political ideologies of the past are completely failed, they're completely unserious, there's no time for serious conversations. Um, he even did an interview recently where he said, oh, you know, there, there's certain topics that you simply can't discuss. Um, you know, you, you, you can come out as, as a flat earther and people just kind of laugh at you and, and think you're crazy, but there are certain um, conspiracy topics that it, that that the, you know if you if you bring up you know the regime will will crack the hammer down very very quickly, um, and so obviously the Mises Institute will continue to be a platform for conversations that modern Fox will certainly not be hosting. I'm very excited to see, um, you know, I, I, again, I have a feeling we have not heard the last from Tucker Carlson, and if our listeners are interested in learning more about this uh, a Buckley Rothbard dynamic. There is no better read than the book, The Betrayal of the American Right, it has a great introduction by Tom Woods. And Radio Rothbard listeners can get 20% off that fantastic book um, at the Mises sto store using our promo code ROTHPOD, that is R-O-T-H-P-O-D. Highly recommend it. It's also a uh, audio book and I think a free audiobook on most mainstream uh, podcast platforms. I know I have it on my Spotify account. Um, so I can highly recommend if you're interested in this little bit of, of uh, history there um, and kind of particularly, you know, a lot of great stuff about Buckley's connections to the CIA. Hmm. Um, I, I highly recommend our listeners uh, you know, taking advantage of, again, some of our great material at Mises.org. Uh, and again, get your Radio Rothbard mug at uh, Mises.org slash Roth mug. I've done enough shilling, Ryan. Any last words on your end before we close out this episode? No, but I think moving forward as the economy uh, continues to weaken and the U.S. gets more and more broke, uh, there is going to have to be some sort of realignment in these political coalitions. So uh, I think at Mises.org, you'll get a sense of of what consistency looks like because <laughs> we haven't changed our foreign policy in 40 years and really nothing has changed at all uh and i think if you want to want to really know what a more accurate historical view of the of the conservative movement is as well as just uh the laissez-faire movement in general we do have a lot of that content uh, at Mises.org. So I recommend you look around and I'll, sure, I'll feature some more of that good history uh, here in the next few weeks on the site. And I think you may find some of it uh, to be quite interesting. I think a lot of the myths about where the conservative movement came from continue to be pretty popular and they get handed down uh, to to new people by organizations that are, uh, you know, the, like these conservative think tanks and stuff. But most of that information is just wrong. 
Uh, and so we're happy to provide you with the, the more correct version of movement history at Mises.org. So I'll, I'll uh, make some of that more available. Excellent. Well, again, if you are interested in these topics, I'm going to post within our show links. We're going to have a copy of the infamous Buckley obituary. We're going to have I'm going to link to Paul Godfrey's uh, address and also a video with that. I'll, we'll, we'll link in some good Rothbard material as well and a link to that Betrayal of the American Right, which you can get a 20% discount on at the Mises store with the promo code ROTHPOD. Um, for Ryan McMakin, this is Tho Bishop. This has been Radio Rothbard. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.